Hello and welcome. My name is Eve Miller and I'm the cellist for the Bach Collegium of Philadelphia and I'm here with the music director for Choral Arts in the Bach Collegium, Matthew Glendorf. Hi Matt. Hello Eve. I'm so excited because we're actually sitting in the same room together. I know. This is <laughs> incredible. We're both fully vaccinated. It's amazing. Amazing to be able to do it. Yeah. Mm. And this is the intro to what is hopefully going to be our last virtual concert yes. because we miss interacting with our audience. Yes, stuff like. we miss you guys a lot. So I basically wanted to sit and talk with Matt for a few minutes um, before the show to ask him some questions because we did um, a production including the 4A Requiem. So I wanted to ask first, um, why did 4A compose his Requiem? Um, what are the origins and why did you pick this work at this time? So I think to answer the last question first, you know, um, as we now are emerging out of this pandemic and as we are beginning to sort of resume something close to um, our normal lives. It just, I felt that we needed to take a moment to just kind of contemplate what we've all been through. And I just couldn't think of any more beautiful piece to commemorate also the, the, the losses and the sadnesses. I mean, we've lost friends, we've lost family. Um, many of us, of course, have gotten sick or had friends who got sick. And, you know, I think all that grief needs to be addressed in some way, but in a way that I feel is cathartic and healing. And I, I think that the Fauré is for that re probably one of the most importantly known choral works, most popular choral works. And I think for that very reason, because there's a catharsis about it. Wonderful, and it's so exquisitely beautiful, the work. I mean, it's just ravishing. It, it is, and you know, there's a couple, so why did he write it? Well, it's interesting because he did not have a commission for it. So he oh. wrote it really, for his own pleasure and to kind of work through his own grief. He had lost both of his parents around the, this time in his life. and uh, But he was also active as the organist and choir master at uh, the Church of the Madeleine in Paris. So he was a workaday work church musician, so he had to provide the music for all masses, weddings, funerals. And so this was written uh, for a funeral, uh, well, for, you know, for the repertoire at the Madeleine to be performed for, for funeral masses. So it was not conceived as a, as a concert work at all. Wow, I never knew that. And uh, so it, it, uh, he, he worked on it between sort of 1887 to 1888, and it had its premiere at a funeral mass on January the 16th in 1888. That's its first version. Um, he uh, only set, first of all, the intro requiem, the Sanctus, the uh, Piezu, the Agnus Dei, and the In Paradisum. And then he added um, the Offertorium and the Liber Ame at a different point in mm -hmm. history. Um, so there's other versions from 1889. Uh, an 1893 version, and then finally the version that I think we all probably heard the first with the full orchestra mm -hmm. was actually from 1900, and he didn't orchestrate it himself. It was his um, his pupil uh, Roger Ducasse, who who we believe did the the uh, that big orchestral version. Mm -hmm. So the piece is actually kind of a work in progress. It, it's in, and I spent some time looking at the original manuscript, and it's so fascinating. Because it really, at the core of it, is the organ and the strings, mm -hmm. and then two movements that have harp and violin, solo violin. Um, and th then in pencil, you see that he starts to add a couple of trumpet parts and some horn parts and bassoon parts, and you see that he's just kind of adding to the piece as he keeps wow. performing so it. Wow, so he's just reworking it over time. Yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. so, so there's no such thing as a definitive version of the Fourier Requiem. But I think it, what, what we did with just the eight singers and this particular version by David Hill that has um, violin, cello, organ, harp, I feel kind of gets at the intimacy of, of what he really originally intended. Wonderful. I know as a performer, it's quite exciting to play with that small of an ensemble. It yeah. feels very um, vulnerable and exposed, but in a tender way, like with this repertoire, you know, it's, it's pretty yes. amazing. Yeah, and, and it was it was wonderful. I mean, and because everybody in this version really counts. Mm -hmm. Your part is integral. Um, and of course, you've luckily played in this performance. You know, Mandy's part is is integral. The organ actually is kind of the glue that holds the whole thing together. Um, so yeah, that's that's the sort of the origin of the of the work. And so even though. Uh, this version is not one that Foray himself made. I feel that it's very much in the spirit of this this 
sort of workaday piece that that would have been used at a, at a funeral mass in Paris in the late 19th century. Wow, that's incredible. I love hearing the story behind it because I didn't really know much about the piece. I've played it several times before, but it, it's cool to hear the background. I'm curious, um, is there something about this that makes it um, performance practice? Because we do a lot of historically informed performance practice together on a regular basis, um, but usually it's 18th century and now we're into late 19th century. Yes. Can you talk a little about that? So. Um, Essentially, the standardized form of Latin, uh, the so-called ecclesiastical Latin that is us usually heard uh, in most performances, um, was actually not at all practiced before about 1903, mm. when there was this big reform and uh, there was a kind of a standardization of how Latin would have been pronounced in, say, England and France and, and other countries. So we really use Gallic and Latin for mm. this. So, for example, um, instead of luceat, we would say luceat. The word lux would become lux. Um, and so I thought, you know, I believe that if we use the, for, the, the Latin that Foray would have known, it's going to give the piece a completely different color. Mm -hmm. And I think it really does. Mm -hmm. You know, and we were also, of course, exploring different kinds of late 19th century performance practice techniques. Yeah. Still not a lot of vibrato, playing with a very, very sort of slow, seamless bow stroke. Mm -hmm. And and of course, being able to slide and, and play through the slides, yeah. which I think is kind of a sexy sound. It is, know. and it's really unusual and something I don't get to do that, that often anymore. So it was pretty exciting to, to work with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I hope that we can actually explore more 19th century performance practice Excellent. as we all come back. Oh, that's exciting, really yeah. great. Um, well, do you want to tell us a little bit about the la the other piece on the program, uh, Nymphe de Bois? Yes, Nymphe Nymph. de Bois. Ah, okay. <laughs> if we are now using 15th, 16th century French, <laughs> Um, was written by probably one of the greatest uh, Franco-Flemish composers, uh, Josquin Dupré. And what's amazing about this piece is that there was a tradition in which composers would pay homage to their teachers mm, nice. um, as a, you know, a musical epitaph. Yeah. And, and that is exactly what this is. And, and it is a lamentation or a déploration for his teacher, uh, Johannes Ockeghem, who was probably one of the greatest um, composers of polyphony before Josquin. And um, what's touching is um, he he lists of all of the composers of, of polyphony, like Brumel um, and other composers that he lists. Um, Akagam stands out as the great master. And he quotes, actually, in the tenor line, he uses the chant of the Requiem mm. um, throughout. And, and it ends with... Uh, requiescat in pace, so in other words, rest in peace. And so then that leads in from this 16th century tribute to, uh, you know, as a sort of a personalized tribute to then the foray. Mm -hmm. um, That's excellent. I have a question for you. This is really off the cuff. Yes. So I'm curious, um, is there a difference in vocal approach when you're working on those two different pieces? And I was out of the room when you were recording the Josquin. So how many voices is it? Was it for the full eight voices? Yeah. And I actually joined in on, and made nine. So. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Can you talk? Is there is there some difference of technique there? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, definitely you want a much more sort of direct um and very, very bright sound so that uh, all of the the thirds, uh, whether major or minor, really, really can be tuned mm -hmm. carefully and that the fifths are also kind of like slightly wider mm -hmm. um, so that you get um, and the, the use of sort of just intonation so mm -hmm. that these chords really, really ring. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the writing is very, very direct. The... The, the foray, I think, by contrast, um, again, you'll, you'll hear that we're not singing with a lot of vibrato, but again, we also used more portamento than mm -hmm. I think you hear choirs do today. Mm -hmm. So that might be slightly um, slightly different, I think, in the approach yeah. to the performance. Awesome. You know? Yeah, and I love the, the sort of feel of the chamber ensemble, which matched you know, the instrumentation for that. Definitely felt everyone was very responsible for their own part. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, great. There's 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 a couple of interesting things for anybody who's maybe a liturgical geek, you know, because as I said this piece was really written as to be part of the fixed liturgy of the Catholic Church, and you know the texts are are given, you know, there's no deviation, you know, you don't sit and pick your favorite 
things. But what Faure decided to set is interesting because he left out the DSRA. Right. Because he did not want that sort of fire and brim, fire and brimstone approach. Mm. Um, the DSRA would have been chanted probably uh-huh. in, as a part of uh, of the the mass. But there's a, some other sort of interesting features. Now the offertorium, which was added later you begin to see him using imitative polyphony. And there was a kind of a reawakened call for the church to push for 16th century polyphony. And so you see Faure experimenting with kind of creating a late 19th century version Mm -hmm. of kind of like a Palestrina approach to composition, which I think is interesting. That is fascinating. And then the most beautiful movement, of course, is the Pie Jesu, you know, um, which is probably the most beautiful and well-known soprano solo and sung so beautifully by Jess. Jess, I know. So um, wonderful to be back in a room with her. <laughs> oh, I, I know. So it's interesting that he sets, after the Sanctus, he doesn't write the Benedictus, which would normally follow in the mm-hmm. Mass. But at this point, the priest, as you know, in the Old Mass, was saying the prayer um, of consecration silently. Mm-hmm. And so no one could hear. So there was a French tradition of inserting a solo or a, a motet at that point. And he, so he takes the last line of the Pie Jesu, I'm sorry, of the Dies Irae, and puts that then as this sort of elevation motet. And it's just such a beautifully tender moment and, and kind of appeal, sort of this odd, sort of also appeal to the mother of God, you mm-hmm. know, this, this, this very sort of Marian devotion, I feel. Um, so that's uh, that's the other thing. So, and the other thing is that the Agnus Dei and Lux Eterna also dovetail. Why would that be? It's because um, no one would have received communion at a funeral because uh-huh. it was a mass for the dead, right. literally on behalf of the dead. And so there was no need to, to, to break up those movements. So the priest would have uh, consumed the elements and that would have been it. Wow. Um, yeah, so the the other thing that I think is fascinating about the Foray Requiem, and I think why it appeals, is Foray was an agnostic. Mm-hmm. He wasn't sure. Uh, he he had doubts about faith, but he said, uh, and this is his this is a quote of his: "Everything I managed to entertain by way of religious illusion, I put into my Requiem, which moreover is dominated from beginning to end by a very human feeling of faith in eternal rest." Mm. And so um, I think that whether you're a card-carrying Christian or not, um, that you can find that sense of, of, of rest, of catharsis, um, and comfort in this piece. And I, I just I can't think of any piece more better suited to where we find ourselves at the moment.